Thanks with me, please. What about chapter number 10? Let's look at that. Verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God alway. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And he, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Father, bless your word now. Jesus name amen you can be seated Cornelius is a wonderful story in the Bible Cornelius inspires you because you got to keep in mind that he was outside the Commonwealth of Israel was not born a Jew but he believed in the God of Abraham Isaac and Israel he was a believer and he's what you would call probably a proselyte he was one who that uh, had been had accepted the uh, the truth as he knew it and he'd accepted it and received it and God was about to give him more truth he's just like uh, later on when we find Apollos over there preaching and he knew only the baptism of John uh, this is something that I've learned something you need to understand live by this you'll get as much truth as you want God's not interested in your religion he doesn't care one whit about a Baptist name on the front of a building you'll get as much truth as you want most people have a problem with the real truth. They want to hide behind something. You don't understand, folks, that the people in the Bible are not made-up people. These are real people. And you can always go to the Bible and find somebody that's essentially going to do about the same thing you are. That's life. On top of a mountain and then down into a valley. It happens to us. Bad things happen. Good things happen. Abraham, if you'll remember, is the father of the faithful. He lied about his wife. He lied. He lied. Yet God has a way of uh, handling stuff like that. Because Abraham's heart was essentially right. He just didn't know how to handle the situation. He was afraid. So he lied. Isaac did the same thing. <laughs> he lied about his wife. But God still used Isaac. He used him. Somebody said, well, if God won't use a dirty vessel, then who are you, clean one? <laughs> yeah, the only righteousness we have tonight is the righteousness of Christ. Anything else is self-righteousness, and that is a stench in the nostrils of God. I can't tell you tonight how much it stinks when you approach God with your righteousness. What you're saying to God is, well, the death of Christ was a good thing, but it wasn't enough. I'll add to it by what I do. There again, you come to the truth. Do you want the truth? The Bible said you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. A politician said the other day, he said, don't give me the facts, give me the truth. A dumber thing has never been said on this earth and this man's running for president. Once again, I don't want to hear the facts, I want the truth. In plainer words, what he's saying is, I want the agenda, I want the spin on what's happening so that I can feed it to the people. We don't, want what's, we don't want the truth behind it. That's what God will judge you by. He'll judge you whether you want the truth or not. That's what he's going to judge you by. Not how good you've been, whether you want the truth. Because if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Yeah. Truth changes if you accept it. Truth has a ring to it. You've got Jacob. He's a usurper. He's a taker. He's a taker. But until he comes to his end, and when he comes to his end, he becomes a prophet. And he becomes one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. So there's a transition period. Satan will wear you out with what you used to be. But God will take you from what you used to be. And he'll make you into what he wants you to be. Amen. Paul talked about Christ being formed in me. Now he was born again. But what do you mean by Christ is formed in me? You see what I mean? The scripture teaches very clearly that we are the image of the invisible God. 
that he made us in his image. And the Lord Jesus came and restored the image that Adam lost. He restored it. For he was the express image of God. Amen. He was the, he was the invisible God made visible for men to see. All right. So this is who he was. Everything there is is bound up in the Lord Jesus Christ that has any meaning. And anyone who rejects in him in any sense of the word is not a Christian. To, you have to receive everything there is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you are a, a deceiver. Moses, you remember him? He was reluctant to do what God had called him to. He said, I can't talk. I'm not. He said, I'm not. I'm not, uh, I'm not a good talker. I stutter, apparently. And so what he was doing was saying, Now, Lord, you know, I'm sure you mean well, and I want to do the right thing, but I don't have the ability to do what you call me to do. I hear an awful lot of preaching from people who get up and they talk about how God will use your ability. God doesn't want your ability. Your ability is the problem. Your talent and your ability comes between you and the Lord. He'll give you a gift. He'll bless you with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. There are people on the mission field, folks, who, who, who have no ability, but they have a love for God. Amen. And that's all that matters. The men get up in the pulpit and they think, well, oh, I've stuttered and I'm not a speaker and I'm not this. I don't care what you are. Did God call you to preach? This is what he said to Moses. He said, Moses, who gave you your mouth? Who gave you your brain? Who gave you all of this? These are the gifts of God. So the Bible teaches us plainly over there in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Find out what part you are in chapter 13. Seek earnestly the best gifts. Find out what God wants you to do. Because until you get where God wants you to be, you're essentially laboring and laboring and laboring and there's no fruit in it. No fruit. Meanwhile, we'll never get... Well-meaning will never... Yield fruit. This won't do it. Joshua. You know what his biggest problem was? Joshua was a good man now, folks. He was a warrior. You have to understand, God has warriors. And he was a warrior. In other words, he went to battle. He fought on the field. Joshua did. But he, he was presumptuous. He thought because of the previous battles that he had earned something or knew something about how to prepare for a battle. You see? In other words, he took it that, well, we've beaten and defeated this foe before. We can just go ahead and defeat this foe again. And what happened? They lost and they ran naked and bruised from a smaller foe, just an insignificant foe. This was at Ai. And my goodness, God taught him something. Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Do you remember when David and I talked to you in Sunday school this past Sunday morning? He said, you come to me with a spear and a sword and a shield and armor. I said, I come to you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. It's time for the church to start talking about the Lord God Almighty against Caesar. Your enemy is right out there. You're not waiting for him to come. He's out there. There are people out there that are governors of states that despise you. Yes, they do. And they're letting you know it now. They're showing it to you. And there are people in Congress, Senate and the House, both, that literally despise the name of Jesus Christ. Just like our lady was mentioning a moment ago about the Democrat Party. Somebody mentioning God. They don't want God mentioned. I remember in 2016, there was a big uproar about bringing God into it. If I were a Christian, I'd feel very uncomfortable in the Democrat Party right now. That's not to say that everything in the Republican Party is right. There are Republicans that are just as bad as some of the Democrats. Amen. Amen. You can't preach politics to get people saved. That's not going to work. And like they say, this election coming up here in just a few weeks is going to be a big deal. So what makes you think it's a big deal? Look at Kenosha, Wisconsin. Look at Kenosha, Wisconsin. The people are standing up there in front of their businesses their livelihood, armed to the teeth. And they're telling the looters and the rioters, these are not protesters, these are looters and riot. You don't have to defend your building from a, loot, from a, from a protester. If all they are are peaceful protesters, no problem. 
No problem. There's no confrontation. The confrontation comes when the looter and the rioter wants to cross over and burn your business to the ground. How many agree with that tonight? I mean, that's logic. That makes sense, doesn't it? They keep talking about peaceful protesters. No problem with a peaceful protester. He doesn't burn buildings down. Did you know that they concreted one door of a police precinct? They concreted the door so the police couldn't get out and tried to set the building on fire so they could burn them to death inside the building? Is that a peaceful protester? No. No. No in no way. I don't like what's happening to my country. I don't like it, folks. I don't like what's happening to my country. Most of those people walking up and down the streets have never served in the military. They've never served. They don't know anything about the military. Know nothing about it. I don't like what they're doing to my country. There's an awful lot more out there just like me. They don't like what they're doing to our country. And I'm afraid that it's not going to get better. It's so sad. It's not going to, it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. Moses was reluctant. He, uh, he didn't want to speak. But God told him, he said, who made man? Who made his mouth? And then Joshua presumed. He was presumptuous. You don't presume with God. David sinned. God still used him. Fact is, David wrote some of the most beautiful words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Does somebody quote that for me tonight? Does anybody know the 23rd Psalm? Could you stand up and quote it for us? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yeah. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You didn't get that out of a magazine. That didn't come from CNN, CBS, ABC, and, and Fox and the rest of them. That came out of God's word. And that's some of the most beautiful words that you've ever heard in your life. Aren't they beautiful? They are. The 23rd Psalm. Do you know where I heard the 23rd Psalm first time? In the sixth grade at Beaumont Grammar School. Did you know we used to read the Bible and pray at Beaumont Grammar School? Yes, we did. We did. That was a public school building. We used to read the Bible and pray. And Jeremiah complained. Listen to what he said. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Now you ask yourself a question tonight. Why would you feel deceived? Is something happening in your family that, that makes no sense? Then you feel deceived. You feel like, well, my God, you didn't warn me about this. Or why is this happening to me? Right? Why do, why do bad things happen to people? Who want to live for the Lord. This is where Jeremiah, God called him. said, Jeremiah, I've called you. But Jeremiah goes out and he preaches. And they treated him like a dog. He wound up in a pit. And Jeremiah said this, For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay uh, a lot of preachers believe in, in, in a kind of a pseudo Christianity you know kind of a kind of a smooth Christianity folks I believe you either are or you aren't I believe you belong to the Lord or you don't belong to the Lord you can get mad at God and go out here and get drunk falling down drunk wind up out here in a drunk tank somewhere you can get mad at God and go out here and do all kinds of stuff. But let me tell you something. If you belong to him, if you belong to him, his word will still be in your soul. Amen. It'll stay in there. You can't get it out. His word will not leave you. I'll tell you something else. 
Hebrews 12 says, I chasten those I love. He'll chasten you. He'll get your attention. And I will tell you something. God can get your attention. How many have ever had God get their attention? He can get your attention. <laughs> yes, he can. He can get your attention. Now, let's talk about Job for just a minute. Now, this is a real man lived 1900 B.C. Job said, my soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Now, don't be too hard on Job. He'd already lost his children, lost everything he had. He had a wife telling him to curse God. His friends were coming down on him, blaming him, said he was a hypocrite, and there was secret sin in his life. And all of this, they'd already prejudged him. Everything was black and white, simple, cut and dried. Everything's like that in theology for some people. But folks, it's not for me. Because there's a whole lot going on with a human being that's more than just some simple thing you can lay out on a piece of paper. Listen to this. Job said, I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Why? Job is saying, why is this happening to me? We know what it says in the first chapter of Job. There was a day when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord. And Satan also. Hast thou considered my servant Job? We know all about that. But Job didn't see that. He didn't know anything about that. Job was left to simple faith. He said, why? Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever gone through a hard enough time where you say, why? I have. Yeah. I have. I mean, I've gotten off somewhere and just get along with God and say, why is this? Why is this happening? Here says, is it good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress? That thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Let me interpret that for you. Job said, do you feel good about this? About what I look at me, I'm full of boils from the top of my head, bottom of my feet. Look at me, I've lost my family. I've lost everything I've got. But look out here, the wicked. You're shining on them. See, that's what happens. You compare yourself with the unsaved. You compare yourself with the world. Did you know that Jeff Bezos now they've said, they said this today, he's worth $200,000 million. Let me say it a different way. He's worth $200 billion with a B. Nobody has ever gotten to that kind of money. $200 billion. Did you know what? That wouldn't buy him one second in heaven. And it wouldn't buy him one bit of peace for his soul. And if you have $200 billion, you have a burden on you that is unbelievable. Why? For all the good you could do for humanity. For what you could do to get the gospel out. Imagine all the missionaries you could support. Imagine all the schools you could start. Imagine all the work you could get done. Now reach to people. Reach to people where they are. Go out there and feed them first and then give them the gospel. Show them you care. He can do all these things. Bezos can. See what he does. That's over twice what Bill Gates had. At one time, Gates, as high as I ever remember, Gates was over $90 billion. $90 billion, But here we are, $200 billion. Pile of money. Pile of money. Which one do you rather have, that or Christ? <laughs> what should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and what? Loses his own soul. Man. He could drop dead with a heart attack tonight. Then whose would these things be? <laughs> Build bigger barns, the Lord, this guy said. And the Lord said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, thou fool. <laughs> Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as man seeth? Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as man's days? That thou inquirest after mine iniquity, and searcheth after my sin? Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. You know what he's saying? Here's what Job is saying. Job is saying, do you really understand what I'm going through? Do you feel what I feel? Do you, you know, I know you're God. But have you ever hurt? <laughs> have you ever lost anything? Have you ever watched one of your loved ones suffer? This is what Job's saying to God. He is saying, hast thou eyes of flesh? In other words, can you see what a man sees? Or seest thou as man seeth? And you know what? Until the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he had that argument and Satan had it. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he took the eyes of man and he saw as man saw. 
He took the flesh of man and hurt as man hurt. He sorrowed as man sorrow. He hungered as man hunger. Nobody could ever say that. God has experienced pain and suffering. He said, Thy hands have made me, fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Why'd you make me? Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? That's, you brought me up from the clay, you're going to put me back in the clay. What's the point? Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever wondered why humanity just continues on? How many people are alive right now? 7,000 million? 7 billion? <laughs> okay. All right. Since Easter. Since Easter. Now, we may have had a few born since then, you know, but died too. Anyway, we're looking at 7 billion people, 7 billion hearts beating on this earth right now. 7 billion, folks. 7 billion. How many people in America? 330. 330 million, 325 million, 335 million. People in America, all right? United States, 330 million. That's really not much compared to what 7 billion. What's going on? What's the purpose? What's the point in all of this? You ever ask yourself that question? I do. I do. Well, don't judge God. I'm not judging. I'm telling you something. The Almighty knows exactly what He's doing. He has a reason for every one of those beating hearts, every last one of them. It may not be obvious. And we may never understand it in this world. But we will know one day. He said, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as clay. Wilt thou bring me to dust again? Hast thou not poured me out as milk and cuddled me like cheese? Curdled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know that this is with thee. And plain word, Job said, I know you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. Job said, if I sin, then thou markest me and thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. What's he talking about here? 1,900 years before Christ, he had no Bible. Did you know that? There was no Bible, 1900 B.C. No Bible, no church, no teaching priesthood, nothing. Nothing. Melchizedek was around somewhere because he was a contemporary of Abraham, and Abraham was 1900 B.C., but there's no indication here that Job ever met Abraham because he's never mentioned in here. See, Abraham's the father of the faithful. He's talking about righteousness. In plain words, as far back as man, as you can go with man, man understands that there's something about him that's different. That he needs to live according to a standard. That he's accountable. He needs to understand that he can't just turn loose like a wild animal and do as he pleases. He can't do it. This is what's happening in the streets of America. They're like wild animals. They just go out and do as they please. Like there's no accountability to it. And Job said this, he said, you know this. He said, if I sin, then thou makest me, and thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. Thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. If I be wicked, woe unto me, and if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. In other words, it will bring humility to me. I am full of confusion. <laughs> There's nothing like being honest. Let me tell you something, folks. Please hear me tonight. You will never have a relationship with God until you learn to be honest with God. Yeah. Be honest with Him. What's eating on you? Tell Him. We'll say He already knows. I know He does. We want you to acknowledge it. Get it out of the way so you two can communicate. We all got something eating on us. <laughs> then finally, wherefore then hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? Why was I born? Oh, that I had given up the ghost and no eye had seen me. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone that I may take comfort a little before I go whence I shall not return. Even to the land of darkness, the shadow of death, the land of darkness is darkness itself, and to the shadow of death without any order and where the light is as darkness. In other words, let me go to Sheol. Shield's a Hebrew word. It means the unseen state of the dead. 
New Testament counterpart is Hades. Well, I thought it meant hell. It does, but there's another side to it. It's got two sides. This is why the rich man lifted up his eye in hell. There's a gulf separating him from Abraham. You see what I mean? The Lord Jesus, when he ascended, he reached down in there, took out what belonged to him, and carried it to heaven. Sheol. This is why Jacob said, I'll go down to the grave. I'll go down. When he'd found out about Joseph, he said, I'll go down to the grave in my sorrow, into the darkness. I'll descend in sorrow. You make a great error in thinking that Old Testament saints knew what you know. They didn't. They knew portions of what you know, but not completely. It's just been revealed to you. The light is blazing in our face. I want to close with this tonight. This inspires me. You've all heard of, of Horatio Spafford. He wrote, It is well with my soul. He lost his four daughters. He was taken to the very spot. Captain said, This is where the ship went down. And there he began to write. There he began to pray. There he began to talk to God. And he wrote, It is well with my soul. That's one of the most beautiful songs in the Bible. He wrote it in great tragedy. Just as I am was written by Charlotte Elliott. She was a lifetime bedridden invalid. Yeah, great sorrow, Charlotte Elliott. But just as I am has been used <laughs> to bring more people to the Lord Jesus than anything I can imagine. I mean, Billy Graham used to play that, sing that all the time in his, in his uh, evangelistic crusade, just as I am. In a uh, fellow by the name of Daniel Whittle, he wrote Showers of Blessings. He was a Civil War uh, veteran. He lost his limbs in the Civil War. Daniel Whittle, there shall be showers of blessings. Luther Bridges lost his wife and all his children in a fire. And he wrote, he keeps me singing. He keeps me singing. All these songs are right here in this book. And then finally, Thomas Dorsey, his wife and son died in childbirth. And he wrote, precious Lord, take my hand. It's good sometimes to know the source of these songs. They were written in great, some of them in great sorrow and tragedy. But it was there, the light, sh the light was able to shine in their soul. It was able to shine in their soul was able to sign. He has suffered has ceased from sin. That's what the Bible said. He that suffers has ceased from sin. All it is, all, all, of, all, of, all of this, all it really is, is that God wants to communicate with you. He wants to talk to you. And sometimes he has to get a few things pushed aside and get to where he can get your attention and talk to you. I'm glad, aren't you, that we belong to a God. We belong to him who knows my frame. And I remember what Abraham said. He knows that I am but dust. And then when he came before the angels, he said, I am dust and ashes. And it wasn't a false humility. That was truth, dust and ashes. Father, bless your word. Good folk who've come tonight, and those who listen. Our Father, you didn't give us a rose garden. You didn't put us in an Eden Lord, it's not a beautiful place in this world. We're in the midst of trouble and sorrow all around. And Lord, it's not the sorrow and the trouble that we look at. We look at you. We look at you. We lift our eyes toward heaven. And we pray tonight in Jesus' name that these words that I've given out will take root in the heart of the people. They'll get something from it that's good. To understand that there's a lot of stuff we don't understand, but you're God. And that's good enough. We know you. In thy, in thy holy, righteous name we pray. Amen. Amen, folks. God bless you.